Okay, so we should get started. Um, so today's speaker is Elizabeth Aki, and she is a postdoc researcher. Um, um, she's um, actually the postdoc researcher for uh, clinical and institutional science at UCI, and she actually is here in the informatics department working with primarily with Kai, and also she's working with me and sometimes collaborate with Melissa as well. Um, she's uh, graduated, she's here only 10 months, eight months actually, eight Five months, <laughs> yeah. Um, she's a graduate from the uh, Pennsylvania State University with a PhD <coughs> in information science and technology, and she, in her PhD study, um, she examined, her works exams um, college women with eating disorders use misuse um, health and fitness apps. Um, so her ongoing work, including uh, studying college women, um, uh, college students with mental health issue, and uh, um, ongoing study with uh, people with eating disorder. So I do wanted to point out that I know Liz for many, many years, and then um, uh, her work is um, uh, he, she's, uh, her work is very interesting, and then um, I heard a lot of um, ongoing, she's going to talk about a lot of uh, her ongoing work today in the seminar. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you everybody for coming out on this beautiful Friday. <laughs> um, I do have to say, coming from Pennsylvania, most Fridays are very beautiful here, so I've been enjoying that. <laughs> um, so today my talk is entitled, Thinking Beyond User Needs, The Importance of Designing for Mental Health. So what I'm gonna be talking is including, but it's more than just designing technology for mental health issues. So I'm talking beyond um, designing some technologies to support depression or eating disorders, or even wellness practices. What I'm gonna be doing today is kind of giving you a snippet of some of my work focusing on really the unintended negative consequences. So these negative effects that happen from using technology. And the idea here is that it's supposed to highlight the importance of putting mental health at the forefront of all technology design, whether it's for a specific health technology or not. So this isn't to say that there isn't uh, any positive things uh, that uh, come out with the interaction of these technologies. There certainly are, and in my work, I study both the positives and the negative sides, but today I'm just gonna be focusing on the negatives. And that's because I'm talking about maximizing benefit while minimizing harm. How do we do that by focusing on mental health? So the first thing that I kind of wanted just to do was to orient ourselves around what do I mean by mental health when I'm saying this? Mental health really falls under this umbrella term that is known as well-being. And when we think about well-being, this really encompasses um, all aspects of our life. It integrates both our mental and our, our mind, as well as our physical health and our body, um, it's actually a valid population outcome measure that tells uh, us about how people perceive their overall life. Um, and with advancements in science, we can actually accurately um, measure well-being. Um, it gives us more holistic approaches to disease prevention and also health promotion by focusing on well-being. So not just physical health, not just mental health, but well-being. And well-being matters. Um, lots of longitudinal studies have linked well-being to um, self-perceived health, longevity, healthy behaviors, mental illness, physical illness, social connectedness, and productivity. So this means if we want people to live longer, if we want to persuade them to do healthier things, if we want to prevent mental illness and prevent physical illness, if we want people to feel more connected to others in their community, um, and we want them to be more productive and lead a more productive life, then we need to focus on well-being. So well-being encompasses a lot of different things you can see here, um, including physical, mental, uh, emotional, even economical well-being. But for the purposes of my research, because I'm focusing on mental health, I really focus on this social well-being, emotional well-being, and psychological well-being. So we really can think of mental health as the emotional, psychological, and social well-being of a person. I also want to point out that mental health is more than the absence of a mental illness. The reason that I focus on mental health more broadly is because really it impacts all aspects of our lives. It affects how we think, how we act, how we feel, how we relate to others, choices that we make. Um, and mental illness is still underdiagnosed and treatment rates are still relatively low compared to how many people suffer from mental illness. So that's why I'm taking kind of a broader perspective of what mental health is. So when you look at poor mental health versus mental illness, these are related, but they're not the same. But yet, so um, poor mental health can interfere with your life, 
Um, and it also increases the likelihood that you'll develop a clinical mental illness. If we look at mental illness specifically, um, it is a leading cause of disability worldwide. When you have a mental illness that increases your likelihood of having other chronic conditions, uh, things like uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, um, those with mental illness uh, have lower use of medical care um, and reduced adherence to treatment, so that's also an issue. And of course, higher risks of uh, adverse health outcomes. So looking specifically at mental illness, we have kind of a mix here, but how about all of you over here? Can you raise your hand for me? If we look around the room, more than 50% of this room in some time in their lifetime will be diagnosed with a uh, medical, uh, mental disorder. And I think that's a pretty profound statistic. That's a lot of people. And any given year, one in approximately six US adults will be diagnosed with a mental illness. That's a, uh, it's more than 18% of um, all, the US, all the adults in the US, and 45.7 million people in the US in any given year have a mental illness. The statistics aren't better with children. Uh, one in approximately six children, um, either currently or during their, their life, um, have had a serious mental illness. And so for me, it's important to focus on mental health and mental illness, but kind of taking this broader approach to mental health, because even if you don't have, even if you're lucky and you're of the 50% that never get diagnosed or never have a, have a mental illness, mental health still affects your day-to-day -day life. We all have mental health. So now kind of moving into the, the point of this talk, um, there are so many factors in our physical and social environment that influence our mental health, and technology is one of those things. So technology has really changed our lives in many ways. If we think of just the smartphone, um, the things that it's provided with us and how it's changed our life, even in the last decade, are really profound. And when we create these technologies or there's the next new technological advancement, it's really, really exciting. We think about all the wonderful things that it can do to change our lives for the better. But with the promise of these technologies often comes pitfalls, and we need to focus on those too. Um, a lot of the times, technologies impact our psychological health both directly and indirectly. And in any domain, we really want to avoid this. So now I'm going to give a few examples um, of these technologies, first starting just with the smartphone. So we know that smartphones are very, very prevalent. 77% um, or so of all adults in the US have a smartphone. This is up from only 35% in 2011. We all know this. I'm sure everybody in this room has a smartphone. And 94% of 18 to 24 year olds um, have a cell phone and 73% of teenagers have access to a cell phone. The issue is these numbers, the 94% and the 73%, um, we know that mental health issues are very prevalent among teenagers and among uh, young adults. So the promise with these technologies was improved communication, organization of your lives, faster email, um, information to really, for anything that you could, could ever want, tools, so things like health apps now and now that we have wearables that hook up to our smartphones, um, all of these things were meant to change our lives. And in many ways they have, and there are a lot of positives to those things. But now we're starting to see a conversation around these negative aspects. So this is a quote from a former Apple executive. Um, he says, these things can be incredibly addictive, it's amazing, but there are a lot of unintended consequences. And we also see this echoed in a lot of popular press. So you're seeing, especially within the last year, um, more conversations about smartphone addiction and um, technology and its impact on our mental health. And while we need to be careful with this framing, because we know that popular press tends to sensationalize these things, we do know that there's evidence to support that smartphones impact our sleep, they affect our in-person interactions. Um, there was a, a cool study, that they, an experimental study that they did where they had people complete cognitive tasks, so they had them do word searches and they had them put their phone away, but they could see it kind of in the distance, and they found that when people's phones were ringing, their heart rate, rate increased, their blood pressure increased, um, their anxiety increased, their general sense of unpleasantness increased, and also their um, ability to perform the cognitive, cognitive task declined. So just because they could see that their phone was going off and they were unable to answer it, um, they had all these sort of negative impacts on their mental health. 
The other study, the um, in-person interaction study, that one was also kind of cool. So they had people sit and have conversations with one another. And just the presence of a cell phone impacted people's perceptions of how empathetic the other person was um, and how meaningful and engaged that conversation was. And all of, the th all of these things we know impact our mental health. So if we have poor sleep, if we don't have that social connectedness, um, you know, anxiety and unpleasantness, this all impacts our mental health. So it's not just about smartphones. I think we really need to ask, okay, what are the things that smartphones provide us? And for me, my research falls under two kind of areas. So one is health apps. So I focus on these because these are specific to health and my area really is health informatics. And usually they have a specific type of user in mind when these technologies are designed. But I also look at social media. And the reason I do this is because social media is a general purpose technology that's often appropriated for various um, health oriented things and also impacts our health in, in various ways. And really, if you think about social media, nowadays the user is meant to be anyone or really everyone. So if we look at health apps, um, this statistic is from 2015, so I imagine it's a little bit higher now. Um, so 58% of people in the US have downloaded a health app. And there's lots of research on personal informatics, self-tracking tools, health apps, and wearable devices. And these hold a lot of promise. They're meant to empower us, give us agency over our health. They're meant to promote positive behavior change, um, help with diagnosis and uh, disease management, and overall just improve our health. So my work has looked specifically at diet and fitness uh, tracking apps, as Yunan had mentioned. Um, I published some of this work in CHI, as well as the Journal of Medical Inter Internet Research and Group. So looking specifically at diet and fitness tracking apps, uh, they're very popular. They're among the most uh, popular health apps that are available. And they're often touted as a means to improve the obesity epidemic, especially in the US, and just generally improve health. So you'll see this huge fitness craze and everybody's picking up health apps, uh, diet and fitness tracking health apps to really improve their lives for the better. So my focus was to look at um, sort of the downsides of this. So the first thing that I did was look at a popular uh, health app. It has a forum associated with it. So we looked at both profile data and posts on this forum. And um, at the time the data was collected uh, and after it was cleaned, of course, we had 18, roughly 18,000 users, um, approximately 322,000 posts over approximately uh, 24,000 threads. I just want to point your attention to some key findings. So in this study, when we analyzed users' profile data, we looked at the different types of goals that they had set. And approximately 7% of the entire um, population had underweight goals. So their goal by using this diet and fitness tracking app was to be underweight according to their BMI. And we know that BMI has some flaws, but it's also used by lots of medical professionals um, to look at uh, both general health and also uh, eating disorders. So I thought that was pretty astounding. Um, and of these 7% of users who want to be underweight, the vast majority of them are female. So then looking at some posts, we also analyzed some data um, using a qualitative thematic analysis to see what people are talking about in the forums about how the app impacts them. And so um, this particular user talks uh, about how um, this particular app just gives you, kind of spits out a number and you're just supposed to go along with it. So they say, I set my goal to two pounds per week in order to get things accomplished faster. My budget was around 900 calories, which I ate. Drop pounds is the one calculating the calories people consume. While we cannot solely blame drop pounds for its cold calculation, we have to consider the ignorance of many people who are using this program and who are destroying their well-being in the process. So the idea here is this person didn't disclose that they had any former eating disorder or history of mental illness, but they're talking about just general well-being and how they wanted to accomplish things faster, so they put in whatever plan they wanted, the app spit out a number, and they just kind of took that as what they should do. And for a while, that's what they did. So kind of building on this, seeing these uh, posts within this forum kind of got me thinking and realizing that the vast majority of those users who um, set underweight goals were female, I decided to uh, do a, a more qualitative focus study on uh, college women. And the reason I chose this population is because we know that 
Um, within the first year of college, body dissatisfaction and just general weight perception um, really declines for college women. 43% uh, of college women diet, even though 78% of them are within the healthy weight range. Um, and we also know that dieting behaviors are risk factors for eating disorders. And just in general, college women, approximately 40 to 49% of all college women engage in some type of eating disorder be behavior on a weekly basis. So as part of this study, you can kind of see how the setup was here. Um, we did a general survey, then we did think about exercises. So I had um, these participants come in and they would show me how they use their app and I would video record what they were doing with the type of app that they were using. And then I followed up with semi-structured interviews to talk more about their perceptions of these apps, uh, perceptions of eating disorders and mental illness generally, and also um, other technology that they used. So I found a lot of things. The data was very, very rich. Um, but I'm going to focus on just the unintended negative consequences, and I'm going to just point to a couple here. So among these sort of eight unintended negative consequences we, uh, I found, they talked a lot about how the technology made them fixated on numbers. So that makes sense, the push for the quantified self, and now we have the kind of this backlash of people becoming too fixated on numbers. They often developed rigid diets where they had safe foods, so they would only consume things that they basically had already consumed because it was really easy to access in their log. Um, they talked about sort of developing an obsession uh, with the app and with food in general. And they also talked about having this app dependency. So in, in many cases, they realized at some point that their behaviors were, were unhealthy or the app was unhealthy for them. Um, but then they felt like they couldn't stop using the app. When they stopped using the app, they felt a lot of anxiety. They also talked a lot about um, these sort of really polar opposite emotions. So either a high sense of achievement when they would um, eat under their calorie budget and also really extreme negative emo emotions when they would consume more than their calorie budget. They also talked about being in excess competition not only with themselves, so trying to beat what they did the previous days, um, but also with the app. They actually kind of personify the app saying that they were competing against what the app told them to do. Um, and finally, they would get some motivation from negative messages. So sometimes when the app would say, hey, um, you might not be eating enough calories for the day, they kind of saw that as a positive thing because that made them get closer to their goal. So I'm just going to highlight um, a couple aspects of the design. So I want to preface by saying I didn't focus on MyFitnessPal only, but the vast majority of my users use MyFitnessPal as their primary app. So because of that, I'm going to focus on some screenshots from my fitness pal. So you can see in the top left there, um, say somebody's calorie budget is 1,200 calories. They're under their budget for the day. You see, okay, green number. Makes sense. 1,200 calorie budget, uh, eat over your calorie budget. Now you're in the red. Okay, we probably chose these colors because they have connotations in society, green and red. But they're not, this app isn't sophisticated enough to be very nuanced. So if you see on the right hand side there, it doesn't matter if you're over your calorie budget by almost a thousand calories or one calorie, the visualization is the same. But the implication for health is very different. So I feel like that kind of pushed users to feel a certain way, but we could probably fix this to be a little bit more in line with what we really want the app to do. And I'm just going to highlight a quote that really epitomizes how users felt about uh, these red visualizations especially. Um, so this user says that red number would scare me a lot because I'd be like, well now I can't eat anything and I'm really hungry. If I ended up eating, I would wake up feeling guilt for going over my intake. I would get really stressed out, even panic because I would be ashamed because I felt like I wasted my whole day when I was fasting. It was just very stressful to deal with the red numbers. The red number would come and I'd be over my calories and it just freaks me out all the time. I wouldn't even want to go to school if I knew I ate too much that night or the day before. Then that caused that to become a fear food that I try to exclude from my diet, but diet because that leads to a red number that embarrasses me. So they talked about, you can kind of see here this interaction between their own personal self and either their predisposition to eating disorders or um, other triggers that they were experiencing during college, and really that interaction with the technology and the design of technology. So they began to associate certain foods with this red number and they stopped eating those foods. 
and because of their, their mental health issues, didn't want to go to school because they felt all this guilt and shame. So in addition to um, these visualizations for the calories, there were some other things that I thought were kind of interesting that I want to point out. So within MyFitnessPal and a lot of the other popular health apps, of course you can set goals. That's usually um, one of the main things that they do within, especially these ones that track your diet. So the cool thing is you can actually set weight gain goals. And one of the findings of my study was that actually women use the apps um, eventually to try and help them to recover from their eating disorder. So when they realize that there's an issue and they want to make a change, then they actually set weight gain goals within the app. So that's a very positive thing and that could be a really cool way to appropriate health apps and you know, reach more, more people. But if you look here, this particular user, um, they have a weight gain goal of a half pound per week. And if you see on the top there, their calorie budget is 1,700 calories and they ate 1,300 calories and they have 420 remaining, yet they're in the green. On the flip side, the next day they eat over their calorie budget and they're in the red. But if we think about that, that doesn't really make sense for the goal that they set. If they want to uh, gain weight, then aren't they closer to reaching their goal when they're eating over their calorie budget than when they're eating under? So these visualizations are, they're very basic. They don't really match what users are trying to do. And I think we need to be careful with that. Um, a lot of the women would talk about how that kind of pushed them over the edge because they were trying to um, recover from their eating disorder and set these healthy goals, but yet the app was telling them that by eating over their calorie budget, they were in the wrong, and by eating under, they were in the right. So another interesting thing is um, with my fitness pal is that at the end of the day, you can decide to complete your diary. And so that means you're done logging for the day, and a lot of people would do this to really say, okay, I'm done, I'm not gonna eat any, any more anything today. So when you click this, the um, app is sophisticated enough to know that if you have a 1200 calorie goal and you eat for say say you don't need any calories for the day, it's pretty extreme but say you don't need any calories it'll say okay you didn't eat enough calories for today and it won't tell you what you would weigh in five weeks but the weird thing is is that the app isn't sophisticated enough to know that if you eat a thousand calories and then you exercise for more than you ate that that's still really unhealthy and you're compensating um, for your calories through exercise and that you have a, over 1,300 calories remaining, yet when you hit complete diary, it tells you, oh, if every day were like today, you would weigh 83 pounds in five weeks. It's not <laughs> the thing I think we want to promote with these apps. Yeah. So I have a question, and if this goes into your future slides, you can let me know, but how do you, when you have a, 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 a project where the goal of what you're, the task that you're doing is to achieve something and you have to do certain behaviors to achieve that um, and when you don't do those behaviors you're not getting closer to that goal how do you express that without putting it into a right wrong mentality like how can you avoid the the just that binary that, that mm -hmm. is necessary in order for you to change your behavior or not I don't know no no I think that's a great question and I don't have an answer yet. That's kind of what I'm working towards. So really the first step of my work is to look at the perceptions, <coughs> risks, and consequences of technology, and then ask, okay, how do we actually design if we want to focus on mental health? What do we do when we're trying to, because you're using different motivations, and this is a motivation technique, really. You're using a positive reinforcement or really punishment to kind of encourage users. And we know like in health behavior change literature that some of these things are effective, but we have to be careful. And so I don't know the answer yet, but I'm working towards that. <laughs> I think it's an excellent question. So really, if we look across both of these studies, really, these are two different populations, but they're both using a popular <coughs> health app. And really, these uh, apps are encouraging and sometimes triggering problematic dieting behaviors and sometimes even eating disorder behaviors. And the reason we care is because eating disorder behaviors and problematic dieting behaviors contribute to poor mental health. And we know that poor mental health has a negative impact on our well-being. And this incre increases your likelihood of developing a full-blown eating disorder. Um, and eating disorders are associated with other mental health conditions. So depression, anxiety, self-injury, and even suicide are very comorbid with eating disorders. And also with eating disorders, there's that physical health component. So with any mental health aspect of your well-being, 
I would argue that it impacts your physical health. But with eating disorders, you can especially see that um, because you have poor dietary quality, often malnutrition, um, organ failure, and even death um, for those who restrict too much. So with these uh, health apps, you might say, okay, well, maybe that's not the intended population of these apps. And while I would argue that um, we, have to be we have to be really careful because that's how, who is actually using the app and what's actually happening, and that's what we need to focus on, I'm gonna turn your attention now to social media. And the reason is because it's not necessarily specific to health, but has health implications, and arguably everybody and anybody is a social media user. That's kind of your target, target user. So uh, approximately 70% of all people in the US use some social media platform, and we know that this is increases even more as we look at uh, younger people. So those 18 to 29 year olds, 88% of them use some social media platform. And social media um, has a lot, of, a lot of promise as well. It's meant to connect us, um, whether that's to, to similar others or people from across the country or across the world that we're not um, in immediate contact with. It's, it gives us a new alternative to communication. Uh, we can find support uh, through social media. And it gives us access to information and we can share things about all topics on social media. So my uh, research in the social media realm really focuses on social media and mental health. Um, some of this work's been published at iConference. So the first study I'm gonna talk about is uh, social media use among women with eating disorder behaviors. Um, so this came out of uh, some interviews that I did with college women who sort of self-identified as having problem eating at some point um, within the last few years. And I asked them about their social media use, and a lot of them used Instagram. And so I looked a little bit deeper into their interviews and again conducted um, a qualitative thematic analysis of what they were saying. And I found a lot of different things, but I'm just gonna draw your attention to one thing. And this is very consistent with uh, literature on social media and its effects, um, is that these women were saying, um, even those women that were trying to use Instagram to uh, self-track really the recovery process or uh, healthy eating to kind of um, promote themselves to uh, really engage in healthier behaviors, they talked about how Instagram really promoted comparison among each other and how that was a problem for them trying to be healthy. So in this way, they were using Instagram, they were basically using it to take photos of their meals and using that um, to really track their meals versus using health apps and having that um, really quantified focus. Um, so this uh, participant says, I'd say Instagram plays a big part in my eating disorder. I try to taper away from it because looking at some people's portion sizes, I compare myself to that. I'm eating very healthy foods in larger quantities, I think, but then they more, they like, you know, more fatty, good fats and stuff like that, which I'm not getting. And so they have smaller portions because of that, or they're on a weight loss goal, so I don't even consider some of those factors. I just see like, oh, they're eating less than me and they're exercising more than me. So I kind of feel like I need to measure up to that. So even just, taking photos of your meals and comparison your meals to other people. When we do that through technology, even if we have these photos, we lose a lot of contextual factors and meaning around, um, around eating and ar around <coughs> these he healthy behaviors. So in this case, she kind of knows in the back of her head that she has a weight gain goal, so she has to eat larger quantities, and she's eating a lot of uh, healthy food. She talked about being an athlete and eating um, lean protein and then um, a lot of vegetables. So her portion sizes look much larger than somebody who is on a weight loss goal or somebody who is not eating a ton of vegetables, but yet she still kind of felt this need to eat less because by comparison, her meals were much larger and that did not feel good. So I've also done some work looking at uh, social media use among other undergrad populations. So this is kind of in a preliminary analysis phase. We just um, are in the process of finishing collecting data. We haven't completely finished collecting all data. So we're looking at immigrant uh, undergrads with depression symptoms. And again, this is self-identified depression, so they could be clinically diagnosed or not. Um, and we're interested in seeing what their perceptions are of social media and how it impacts, how they believe it impacts their depression, and also kind of tease out maybe some features of different social media platforms 
um, that may impact them in positive and negative ways. So kind of looking, this is a very preliminary analysis, so this might change a little bit depending on more responses that we give, that we get. But right now, uh, looking at this difference between social media making their depression worse and social media making their depression better, we broke it down by the types of platforms that they say they use. And so generally, right now, there's a fairly even split between people who think that social media makes depression worse and social media that makes depression better. Um, across these different platforms. But one thing that kind of stuck out to me just as this kind of preliminary is on the left-hand side in the green, you'll see approximately 7% uh, of people say that uh, social media makes depression worse and those are users that use LinkedIn versus on the other side, approximately 3%. So to me, that's a little bit interesting because if we think about LinkedIn as a platform, What's its purpose? Its purpose is for jobs. <laughs> its purpose is to have you know, this professional facing profile. So on LinkedIn, you're really only seeing the good things about somebody's life, more so than on maybe other social media platforms where there's this push to talk about the negatives as well. And so that's interesting to me because of the different functions and features of social media platforms. Not all social media platforms are equal in terms of how they affect people. Yeah. The N is 84, is that the same 84 doing both or is that divided with some saying it makes it worse and makes it better? What's the so they could do both. So all 84 answered both. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, how did you decide which apps to put on there? Because there's ones that are not up there that I think might be more relevant to undergrads. And I'm not sure how much Google Plus is relevant to undergrads. So these were the top two, four, six, Eight, nine, the top nine right now. So we actually had a very long list of, I can't even remember how many social media platforms, and we also asked about other social media platforms that maybe were culturally relevant to some immigrant students, but those were of the minority. So this is just kind of a preliminary look at these nine. Were those drawn from the 80 responses, or those just from like a general list of top like global apps. So we had an like a, a full list of like so many global app. Um, I'm sorry, global social media, and then an other box, and then these top nine are just based on the responses. So these were the top nine that people reported using. So the survey also had a qualitative piece where uh, we asked them about, okay, how does social media make your depression, depression better, worse, what features and things would you like to change? So looking on how social media makes their depression worse, basically two themes are emerging. So one again is this idea of comparison. So people are talking about everybody else's lives seem better and I compare myself to that. Um, and also isolation or reduced social interactions. They say using social media just kind of makes them feel more alone. Um, or they feel like people are less likely to talk in person because of social media. So this is just one quote then to look at this kind of, again, this comparison. So different social media platforms, different users, but this idea of comparison continually comes up. So this participant says, very good looking girls, people traveling, and people that have the career I want make me sad and like I'm not good enough. So we saw this over and over again in the, in the qualitative data. So really the issue is looking at social media is that across different populations and different platforms, social media increases the likelihood of comparison and other risk factors for mental health issues like isolation. And again, we care about this because comparison, isolation, these things um, lead to poor mental health and this has a negative impact on our well-being and these are risk factors for uh, clinical mental illness. So if we look at uh, the common thread really across these health app studies and these social media studies is that they are used in different ways, they're used by different populations, but there are negative consequences that are prevalent and they're often overlooked in the initial, um, really in the initial design of these technologies. So one thing that I want to stress here is that we can see when we're talking about these different things that it's just not a matter of the user and it's just not a matter of the design. It's really the interaction between these two things that matters. So when we're looking at, we have to look at the user as everything that surrounds them, so their physical and social environment, but also their personal characteristics. So things like their health history, their personality. All of these things are going to affect how they interact with and how they're impacted by the design of technology. So how can we maybe start to combat some of these issues? So I think before and during technology design, we really need to do a better job of anticipating the negatives. 
I think we can do this first by uh, considering humans as complex individuals. So like I said, we are not, it's, it's very hard to whittle us down to kind of one ideal target user. We have to keep in mind that we are complex people. We have health histories, we have different experiences. Um, and even at any given point, um, how we would react or interact with technology is gonna be different than in the past or in the future. We also have to consider other contextual factors, like I said, like the environment that you're in. Um, your social interactions, and also cultural norms, standards, and values. Um, because th these are really important because how we translate these cultural norms and standards um, is going to determine what the technology looks like and whether or not we're reinforcing these cultural norms and whether or not that's a good or bad thing. So then we really need to ask, okay, how does technology account for these things? How does it translate these things? And how in some cases would it magnify them? So if we return to the example of diet and fitness tracking apps, and we think of the college women who are at increased risk to have eating disorder related behaviors and problematic dieting, if we think of them as complex, then we might want to consider um, their history of disordered eating, uh, personality characteristics like perfectionism and how that would relate to disordered eating or dieting, their self-esteem, and also genetic and biological factors. Um, in terms of context, the college environment and what that means for students, um, we know that there's, you know, when you're put into the college environment for the first time, oftentimes this is the first time that you're on, on your own. This might be the first time that you've cooked a meal. There are lots of other stressors and things that are, are very different um, from your life prior to college. And of course, these cultural norms and values, so we know from a westernized point of view that thin is great and beauty is really important, and we're translating, maybe unknowingly, translating these cultural norms into technology that's meant to support health, but really is supporting this idea of weight loss and thinness. So when we look at how this is translated to design, the design and also kind of this fitness industry, they are fueled by uh, and feed into these cultural norms and values. And I understand that it's a business and you want people to use your technology, but I think if we really wanna make people healthier, we need to be careful about this. So if thin is the ideal, then does thin equal healthy? I mean, we, we kind of give this impression within, within apps. Same thing with weight loss. I mean, a lot of them say, okay, the purpose is to make you healthier, but then you see it's really all about weight loss. It's not really about health. There are other things that indicate health that are not weight loss. So we need to be careful about that. Because we're using weight loss as a proxy to health and it gets into some shaky territory. Uh, I just wanted to kind of provide another quotation from one of my participants that really kind of epitomizes all of these different aspects, really these three things that I'm talking about in terms of context, kind of a complex individual and in this interaction with technology. Um, so this was from the diet and fitness app study of the college women with problematic dieting and eating disorders. She said, I just think high school, I was just, it's hard to explain. High school, you were safe and secure. You were home, you didn't have to deal with that much. And then in college, everything changed. I rushed and joined a sorority. It made me feel horrible about myself. Freshman year was just very stressful being around skinny, pretty people all the time. And I think that just, I don't know, I always felt inadequate and less attractive than everyone. And so I think when I used the app at school, it just, like all that in the background just fueled it, my eating disorder way more. So you can see her, she's talking about this transition from high school to college and how her, her context and her environment really changed and how these brought out new triggers for her problematic dieting. And she talks about um, how all of those things were kind of in the background and then with the app that she was using combined, really fueled her problematic eating. So now that we're seeing sort of all of these unintended negative consequences, consequences we're starting to see a push in the other direction to talk about some um, ways to kind of combat these issues. So in popular press, you might see things like ways to combat smartphone addiction. Uh, recently, Instagram uh, posted some positions for a well-being team to try to combat mental health issues because they were rated as one of the worst social media platforms for mental health ever. So we are seeing this, and some people are starting to talk about this. So um, I, one of the things we actually had a conversation with one of my students was this pull to refresh and how addicting that is. Like, you just want to keep doing that. And so you actually see that people are talking about sort of these unintended negative aspects of these things. And so this is from uh, the person that invented this pull to refresh mechanism. 
Uh, he says, pull to refresh is addictive. Addictive. Twitter is addictive. These are not good things. When I was working on them, it was not something I was more mature enough to think about. I'm not saying I'm mature now. <coughs> I'm a little bit more mature, and I regret the downsides. So we can see that at the initial, when we're designing these technologies, we get really caught up in how exciting they are, <coughs> but we really need to think about some of these downsides. <coughs> And some of this happens because of the way that we kind of think about user needs and the way that we translate them. So we design a technology with a particular user in mind uh, and what we want the technology to do for that user. Then we deploy the technology and then we see its effects. And then we see the unintended consequences. And then we might go back and try and implement some features to combat some of these unintended negative aspects. And I think this is, it's a good start. I'm glad that we're opening the conversation about this, but I think we really need to think beyond just user needs and beyond kind of combating these issues and put, it, put mental health at the forefront. So it's kind of a paradigm shift, I think, in versus looking at you know, design use effects and then go back and redesign, to then let's put mental health at the forefront of all design and then see how that changes how we would actually redesign the technology. So like I said, my work first is focusing on these perceptions, uses, and consequences, and then looking at, okay, how do we design or redesign technology? And so by focusing on these unintended negative consequences, I really think it highlights the need to put mental health at the forefront. And so moving forward, instead of combating these negative effects, I really want to open the conversation and ask the question, okay, what would it look like if we designed technology with mental health as the priority? And I just want to say thank you to my mentors, Kai and Yunan, and of course the informatics department and all of you for coming out today. Um, ICTS, uh, NIH and NSF for their awesome support. And then I'll leave you with this last thought, and I think this is a really good quote from the World Health Organization website that really kind of epitomizes my passion and kind of what I'm trying to put out there. Um, mental health is an integral part of health. Indeed, there is no health without mental health. Thank you. about um, using Instagram and comparing the portion sizes. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to design a system that gets away from this comparison? Or like, is that integral to how social media functions? Like you talk about it with like general social media sites. Right. So what, how do we get away from that? Or like how do we balance like the, the possibilities for positive interactions versus negative interactions? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think with social media, it's almost inherent to the to what social media is. So it's meant to be social, so by that you're kind of looking at other people and I think it's our human nature sometimes to compare and other certain factors influence our, our likelihood to compare more than others. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about a little bit is, so sometimes I don't think that you can completely kind of combat that. But I think we can talk about the role of lapses and abandonment of technology and then what, what that means. Um, so a lot of the times when we talk about like abandonment or when people stop using technology, even for a given period of time, we view that as a very negative, negative thing. So we're always constantly trying to find ways to get the user to use our technology long term consistently, like that is the goal. But I think if we can acknowledge the role of lapses in promoting positive mental health and knowing that people could return when it's, it's good for them, then that's probably the way to go. That might be a way to combat it. If social media is getting to be too much for you, then maybe we can say it's okay to not use it and encourage, take a break, come back. Maybe we can have, you know, you, you're talking about some of these gray outs for your phone to like uh, stop smartphone addiction or prevent it, but maybe there's a way to do that like within specific uh, technologies like social media. Yes? Um, so in this paradigm shift that you think that needs to take place, what role do you think legislation would be involved? Mm. Oh, that's a great <laughs> that's a great question. So I think one of the hardest things when we're talking about what I think for this paradigm shift is it's 
it's legislation and it's even more than legislation. So one thing is we talk about um, businesses and their involvement. So like My Fitness Pal, uh, Lose It, Fitbit, these are really popular. So the point is that they're trying to make money. And so of course they're gonna feed into different cultural stereotypes and of course they're gonna, you know, they have, they have, they have needs and they're trying to make money and they are on deadlines so they can't possibly input everything that I would, as a researcher in you know, academia, would love to see them do. Um, but I do think if we think about, <coughs> to kind of take it higher level, the conversation maybe within like legislation is the importance of mental health. And I think that just as a society, we don't focus on that enough. We can understand that when somebody breaks a bone or when they get cancer, how detrimental that can be to you know, their day-to-day -day functioning. But the conversation, I think, is just starting to happen with mental health and mental illness. And I think it's still really not as understood as it needs to be. And once we get sort of pushed that, maybe through politicians and things like that that focus on the importance of mental illness and mental health, then we'll get closer to that. Yes. So um, I was wondering about like thoughts about collaborations with different disciplines too, because I'm coming from a different perspective. I'm actually uh, from the psychology department, and I study this from the other side, starting from the mental health side. Mm -hmm. um, but there's very few of us doing it. But there is a lot. Like there, on our side, we're like starting from mental health, and the user design is more like unknown to us, you know? And right. um, so I think like a lot of this could be solved by making more connections between these different fields. Um, and I don't know if you've done some of that or if you have some of Yes, and I definitely agree and I think that's so important. So coming to UCI, I recently started working with some people in psychology. Right now we're working on an app that focuses around relational savoring to like promote mental well-being. Um, but I think that more collaboration needs to happen. So we say, okay, we're transdisciplinary, we're interdisciplinary, but what does that actually mean in practice? I think it's difficult because when we think about, okay, first, like, job positions, they're in a specific domain, they're in a department, but we see now that technology is pervasive across lots of different places, and I'll go to psychology and somebody's using the same type of um, computational methods that I'm using to analyze textual data, but yet there's no conversation happening. So I think more of that needs to happen, and I think the closer we get to that, then we can solve these issues more holistically, for sure. Yes? I was thinking about what you described when we're discussing people who have um, uh, a vulnerability to a mental illness being um, having their situations exaggerated or exacerbated by these apps and may make them feel worse and make them have more destructive behaviors. Um, in not accounting, for, like in trying to account for who uses the app, it makes me think of like, should, is, should there be some kind of pre-screening on that? And then it makes me very concerned about how much do we have to reveal about ourselves to these corporations before they can verify if we are valid to use the app for our own good. Yeah, I, like I, that's, it's like, I feel like there's a steep, like if we try to make everything safe for people, then the, the controlling aspect of that on a macro level is very scary to me. Yes, yeah, uh, my gut reaction is like, oh, no way. Like, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know, I, I have an issue, so I wanna make things safer, and I think when you get in the, the territory of like teenagers and children, you gotta be really careful, but I think when you're an adult, you need to make those decisions for yourself, and I don't think the companies are the ones that should be necessarily screening. I think that's why, one of the reasons that I'm trying to push this idea of putting mental health at the forefront, so if, if in the distant idealized future, if that were the case, then still there would be unintended negative consequences. We can't completely get away from that because we're complex people. Like that's just gonna happen. But I think we would be further away from exacerbating them in a lot of different ways and in very extreme ways. Yeah. So I have a question about kind of from, dev from dev developer point of view. So you say that this reactive model that we, we first design something and then deploy and then you see that, let's say, negative consequences, that's the kind of you know, the ongoing trend. But, uh, and we should have this uh, mental health, and, right, we should consider that at the very early stage. But uh, I wonder also a little bit how we can effectively do this because some of these things like to show up when you deploy these things, right? So it, you know, uh, in a different context, we have some to use sometimes, let's say, Models and things like that, to, uh, things like that, but when, to test these these phenomena. But when we're dealing with human, how we can let's say uh, use let's say we cannot use simply predictive models or things like that, right? So how we can uh, 
to do that? I, I really wonder what, what kind of yeah, yeah. ways you can consider. So when I think about this, I think this is kind of the value of looking outside of like what your intended user is. So especially if you're a business and you want lots of people to use your app and say you're a more general, we'll use the example of like the health apps, right? It's not necessarily intended for a very specific user. It's just trying to get lots of people to use the app and hope that they either need to lose weight or they want to be healthier or whatever it is. I think in those cases, then you need to think about maybe other extreme cases of users. So like for them, it would have been useful to look at a population that has, for example, I think diabetes, a population that has binge eating disorder, a population that has anorexia nervosa, because those are kind of, if you think of it as a, like a spectrum of users, those are kind of extreme ways that the app could be used. So I think the importance of that is when we're designing technology, and of course, like my model was very simplistic. I know there's a lot of iterative action that goes into design, um, but I think that's where diversity really matters on your team. Diversity in terms of perspectives, diversity in terms of backgrounds. Um, when you're collaborating with different people, I think that's, <coughs> that's where those things come in, because you really need to think about other types of users outside of that target user. So that's kind of what I'm kind of trying to articulate like beyond the user needs, beyond that target user, if we think about these other user populations and how they would use the app, then what does that mean for the design of our technology? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, with the social media aspect, I know that Facebook and Instagram use, uh, they went from going chronologically posting things to just what it thinks is most interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that has anything to do with uh, mental or giving like a negative or being responsible for the negatives in mental health as like a user would see things that it thinks are interesting first all the time as opposed to seeing it maybe once in 10 minutes, they now see it like 20 times in 10 right. minutes. No, I certainly think that could exacerbate it. So if it's trying to push things that it thinks the user wants to see, but really that's just more people on vacation or wedding photos or baby photos yeah. or whatever it is, then it could, it could certainly, I think, exacerbate that. Mm -hmm. So, and la last question. Yeah. So, just like a little bit crazy. Uh, do you think some sort of rating in terms of mental health care kind of effects or illness could be also good? Let's say people now rate things like uh, five star, four star, mm. things like that. It seems like they, they can really also, Based on you know this kind of uh, the feedback you get from users, you can also at least get some idea. This is something. Have you seen something yeah, like this? I I haven't, but I think that's a really interesting perspective because I know I've looked through. So for example, like user reviews of different types of health apps. So I've looked at like some eating disorder recovery app reviews. I've looked at popular health app reviews, and you see some conversations around like the negative aspects to mental health and positive aspects, but right now I haven't seen anybody try to implement a rating. It's like, okay, let's rate it for like overall, you know, overall whatever, but then also its impact on mental health. I haven't seen that, but that could be cool. It's like the most addictive ones, uh, you know, let's say the most uh, popular games, let's say five-star ones, for instance, are mostly also the most addictive ones, right? Right. So uh, no one's really, when you download something, you just look at the start, okay, it's a five-star app, maybe it's just the best for me. I, I'm just, you know, thinking out loud, maybe. No, yeah, it's a good point because I've done even some stuff looking at like why if, for example, why would women with eating disorders when they're trying to recover, why would they turn to MyFitnessPal and not an eating disorder recovery app? And that's one of the reasons. But so, for example, if MyFitnessPal is more addictive, then really it's going to be uh, counterintuitive to what their goals are. So I think it's a, it's a cool point. Yeah. So just a real quick comment on that. I have heard a presentation a month or two ago about someone who's developing a system to do that, um, oh, cool. to be rating the quality of apps like based on their evidence for like mental health outcomes. Yeah. Um, he said that he like went to Apple once and tried to like get it in there, like, oh, we need this other star rating and nothing. <laughs> There's efforts, but nothing. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> okay, um, that's great conversation. So um, we have a reception downstairs at fifth floor. Um, so I would encourage you guys to go there and grab something and continue to talk to Liz. Thank you.